Welcome back to another volume of Truly Disturbing Tales from Reddit. Today we're going to be narrating three new and settling stories, taken directly from the platform. I encourage you all to sit back, grab a snack, and enjoy these terrifying personal accounts. Now, without any further delay, let's jump right in. The following story is 100% true. And the dates listed are the estimated dates that this story roamed free for me. It was the only time in my entire life that I ever questioned my own sanity and or my own perceptions. I ask that you listen to this story in full, as this is one of those few cases where there is an actual ending to the story. I'm writing this today because I believe that this story is one we all can learn from. Location. A mid-sized city located roughly two and a half hours southwest of Chicago. The town sits right on the Mississippi River, bordering the state of Iowa. The focal point of our story was sited at a small park, smack dab in the middle of town. The park is surrounded by roughly four to five acres of timber. Sometime, roughly in 1993 or 1994, was the first time that I heard about the lady in the woods. I was in fifth grade, hanging out with some other boys on the grade school grounds. The story is your typical ghost story. At Mel Park, our local hangout just blocks away. A child went missing after the sighting of a ghost. More specifically, the ghost of a woman dressed all in white. They didn't know the name of the child, but claimed that it happened in 1987. Another boy chimed in. There was also an adult who went missing, the night after a sighting of this same ghost a few years later. In both cases, the sightings happened after the park had closed, well after midnight. The park is nestled in between neighborhoods, and there have been reports of people who have moved out of their homes after seeing the woman drift through the woods. There were other stories I heard in the years after that included witchcraft, Satan worshipping, kidnapping, murder, and the occult. The story gained more momentum when another boy in our class found a pentagram spray-painted on a tree on a path near the park. We actually rode our bikes out to see it and it was definitely there. Crudely painted in what looked like a real hurry, it was one of those things where there was no real way to know if the pentagram was a part of the story or was put there because of the story. When you're in fifth grade, you rarely stop to think these things through. You only see what's in front of you, and what I was seeing was definitely creepy. May of 1995. A friend of ours named Michael lived only a block away from Mel Park. His parents decided to allow him to have a sleepover for his birthday party. He invited ten of us boys to stay the night, just doing what boys do. God bless those parents, by the way. That night, you can imagine where things headed. Michael knew all the Mel Park ghost stories. He lived the closest of all of us and had a neighbor who gave him all kinds of crazy information, or so he claimed. He rehashed a lot of the stories we had already heard, and even added a few others. After some time, and as the clock made its way near 1 a.m., it finally happened. One of the boys suggested that we sneak out, see if we could find this lady ghost. So that's exactly what we did. We all made it outside quietly enough, and made our way down the street, towards Mel Park. Once we made it to the park, we broke up into groups. A few walked onto the overgrown Little League baseball field. A few headed towards the playground equipment. Myself and another stayed in the parking lot nearest to Michael's house. Yeah, we were the skittish ones. I wish I could give you all kinds of cool things we did, but in real life, it's not that cool. Essentially, we kind of just walked around, looking and waiting. Really, we had only been there for maybe 15 to 20 minutes when it happened. I kid you not, just like the story, within minutes of us showing up, it was like a Lifetime movie. There she was. In the woods, I see what looks like a pale white woman. White hair, white flowing clothes, white pants. In the night, she looked like she was glowing. It was literally the perfect example of what you would think of as a ghost. I've never been so scared in my entire life. To this day, 
it's still the most terrifying moment I've ever been in, and that includes an automobile accident. Everyone saw her, all ten of us. She stuck out like a sore thumb, and we jetted. I mean, we ran faster than any of us had ever ran before, all of us completely silent, moving at our fastest rate, towards Michael's home, and safety. I could embellish here and tell you that she chased us or made a move towards us. I could make it out like her head split in half and bees came flying out, but none of that happened. I don't believe the ghost lady even knew we were there. She looked as if she was simply peering deeper into the woods, as opposed to staring out at us frightened little boys running away terrified. That was that. We all made it back safely. We spent the rest of the night worried this lady ghost is going to show up and kidnap us, but she never showed. We return to school, and the lady of the woods becomes legend. All of us share the story. All of us back each other up. We even told one of our teachers. She politely listened, and then changed the subject. It was the coolest, most terrifying thing that ever happened to us. We had one of the best campfire ghost stories in history, and it was true. So time passes, like it always does. We move on from grade school to junior high, then to graduating high school. Once we got a little older, this story took a backseat to girls and just living life. I wouldn't say the story died. I know we spoke of it in passing. I know the story continued on in the grade school, at least for a short time after we left. One of the ten boys from the birthday party took his life shortly after high school and it took everything in me not to blame this ghost story on that situation. We all move on to college. I lose touch with all but one of the ten, though a few I have on Facebook. 2010. After coming home from college and struggling to find my way in life, I finally start to get my act together. I find a full-time job, married my wife, got a dog, and even had a couple of kids. Eventually, we purchased our first home, which just so happens to be blocks from my childhood house. I end up in a little tiny house, two streets over from Mel Park. After those floating years, I end up back where it all started. On my days off, I walk my dog in the very park where the Lady of the Woods scared me almost to death. This is where you really start to question yourself and your senses. At 27 years old, I would stare at the location where I saw that lady glowing all those years prior and try to make sense of it all. Now older and wiser, you spend a lot more time trying to feel things out rather than just reacting. How in the world did I see a ghost in the fifth grade with nine other people who saw the same thing? I know it wasn't a dream. I know it wasn't imagination. She was really there. What I saw was real but your brain has a funny way of making things fuzzy. It's hard to explain, but you start to question everything. You know it's real, but you know it's not. That sentence shouldn't be, but that's just how my mind would read the situation. It really was something that I wrestled with a bit, just trying to figure it all out. Summer of 2012. There I am, on another walk with my dog, coming up alongside the timber where I saw the lady in the woods all those years ago. I find myself thinking of her again. I'm thinking of my childhood friends. I'm wondering if they ever think of that moment like I do. The thought passes as I move along the path that leads me out of the park. In front of me, a large trailer hooked up to a pickup sits in the driveway nearest the park's wooded area. There's a middle-aged man moving some things onto the trailer as I approach. He sees me and says hello. I say hello back and then decided to make small talk with him. I ask him if he's moving. The man responds that he's just recently sold the home. It was his parents' house, and it had sold to a young couple. Closing was coming up shortly. I mention a few other things, and then start to head off. But I stop. Because that ghost story was on my mind, I decided to ask that man I didn't know if he knew the story himself. Why I did this is beyond me. It's definitely not something I would normally bring up in conversation, but this house was the closest one to the sighting, and I just needed confirmation that somebody else out there still knew the story. 
I don't remember exactly what I said, but I basically asked him if he had ever heard the ghost stories. I'll never, in my remaining years, forget what happened next. The man looks at me and smiles. He tells me he's heard those stories plenty. I'm actually relieved that he had, because I didn't actually think through how the conversation would go if he had no clue what I was talking about. I then proceed to give him the shortened version of the story you just heard. He listened, and I could tell that he was interested. When finished, he takes a moment, and he responds. I used to live in this house before the park was built. My parents raised me here. I moved out in 83 or 84. I think the park was built somewhere between 84 and 86, and my parents had been here ever since. My dad passed away in 91, and it was just my mom after that. That ghost you saw? That was my mom. I looked at him completely confused, but he continues. My mom had some medical issues that started in the mid-80s and continued all the way up until she passed away this last spring. The medicine they had her on will cause her to sleepwalk. I can't even count the amount of times I received calls in the middle of the night from the police department advising me that they had found my mother wandering in the park. I was told recently one of the neighbors moved out because they were tired of all the commotion. My sister lives in Texas. I could never get it through her thick skull that our mom needed to be moved to assisted living, so this went on for years. I found out from some friends that she had become a ghost story to the park. You see, my mom had a favorite robe that was all white and always slept in the same pearl silk pajamas. Everything was white. She even had white gloves she would put on from time to time. I can only imagine what that would look like in the middle of the night. That lamp over there by the playground would light her up like a Christmas tree, so it was never hard for police to locate her. So you see, that ghost you saw? That was just my mom sleepwalking. I bet I even got a call that night. I'm speechless. The lady in the woods was real, and she wasn't a ghost. She wasn't a dream. She was simply a woman. She was this man's mother, lonely and suffering from some medical condition that had her wandering the woods in the middle of the night. I only wish I knew more. I never saw that man again. The new couple moved in probably oblivious to the ghost story its previous occupant had created. So I wonder, does her legend live on? Is there some fifth grader right now hearing the story, for the first time, of the lady in the woods? How she appears and kidnaps children? How there's a witch who murders those who see her in the middle of the night? 2021. I've moved from that tiny house to a bigger house in a new city. I no longer visit Mel Park. I never did learn that lady's name, and I always kick myself for not asking that man more questions. The thing that I find so interesting is how a story can become what it is, how one event can impact individuals like it did me. I still think of that lady all the time. When a story rolls out that seems impossible, the lady in the woods comes to my mind. Sometimes, the story is real but the context is muddled. This single event impacted my approach to everything. I listen, I take in all of the story I can. If it seems impossible, I hold my tongue. Maybe it is impossible, or maybe it's just being interpreted wrong. Last year, I was going out for drinks with my friends but since I had class the next day, I only stayed till around midnight. My boyfriend promised to pick me up and go home with me because I don't like to take the subway alone at night. But since I was pretty drunk by then, I took a little too long walking out of the pub. Unfortunately, we had to wait for the night bus with multiple stops since the subway closes at a certain time on weeknights. For context, my boyfriend and I don't live together, but very close to each other about a 10 minute walk. Both areas are pretty terrible. He lives near a train station, many drug addicts, homeless, and sketchy people around. And I live in a cheap, rough neighborhood with a high crime rate. My building has two entrances on two different streets because it's on the corner. 
I usually use the entrance door that is nearer to the subway and on the side that my apartment is on. We had to take two buses to go home. One drove us to the train station and the next one from the train station to my apartment. After getting out of the first bus, we realized that we would have to wait for about 20 minutes for the second bus to come. And since I really had to sleep at home, class the next day, I didn't want to stay at his place. My boyfriend didn't want to wait, so he persuaded me to walk instead of taking the bus, which sober me would have never done. But since I was still drunk, I didn't care how we got home, so I agreed. We started to walk home and passed a few sketchy people, mostly people selling drugs, but nothing really bad. Then I saw a guy walking in our direction, and I got a bad feeling right about then. So I told my boyfriend that I wanted to change to the other side of the street because I didn't want to walk past him. Suddenly, the guy yelled, hey, as if he wanted to ask us something, but we ignored it and continued to walk. He got louder and louder until he started to yell. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was coming over, so I whispered, run, to my boyfriend. I took his hand and ran the fastest that I could while he was chasing after us. We ran and ran and ran and made a turn to the right, which happened to be the street that I lived on, and hid. It seemed like he was gone, so I took my keys out and we started running towards my building, taking the other entrance of the building that I normally didn't use. As I was trying to open the door, my boyfriend started panicking, throwing me inside the patio and closing the door aggressively, and then pushing me further into the building. He explained that the guy came running from the other side of the street, meaning he took a shortcut, probably thinking we were going to run to the subway or the bus stop. If we had taken the other entrance, he would have been clearly the faster one. Being in shock, we unfortunately didn't call the police, which I now regret. I stopped going out for drinks and clubbing for about six months after this happened and slept at my boyfriend's place for two weeks straight because I was scared that that man would come back. I think the worst thing about this is that he really wanted to get us for some reason, whatever that may have been. I still want to know why he chased us for so long. Two weeks later, a girl about my age was assaulted a few streets away in front of her building by a man that had chased her home. I wonder, was it the same guy or just a coincidence? I'm usually a lurker here, but this memory from a year ago popped into my head and I want to share because I was so shocked in the moment. I realize now just how scary the situation was, and it was just all very strange. Keep in mind, this story is hard to describe, but I'll try my best. I was 22 at the time, and I met my dad at a tire shop in a really bad area downtown. Not really sure why we went to the shop. It was probably around noon. My dad had brought his chihuahua with him so I took her on a walk around the tire shop while he consulted with the mechanics. The shop was about half a football field away from a busy street, with a big field in between the shop and the street, in an otherwise semi-residential area. I figured it was safe enough to walk the dog around in the field, because my dad and the mechanics were right there. However, the shop was fenced in and not facing the field, so I guess it wasn't actually that safe for me because my dad and the employees couldn't see me at all. So I was just walking the little dog around this field, not too close to the busy street, when suddenly, this beat-up car with the windows down starts driving by really slowly on the busy street. I can tell the guy driving was staring at me. The street is somewhat far away from me, and he eventually drives past, so I'm just like, whatever. But then a couple of seconds later, I see the car again, going down the street in the opposite direction, this time really fast. He turns onto the side street where I am, he's driving fast, and then he guns it into the field where I'm walking the dog, literally jumping the curb. He's coming straight for me. 
and I'm stuck in shock, thinking, is he about to plow us down? What is happening? It was so quick and unexpected. In my confused shock, I'm hesitating with the dog, contemplating running away, but also not wanting to turn my back to the car. Then, by some miracle, the car comes to a jolting stop when it becomes lodged in a hole or some uneven patch of ground. The tires are still spinning as he continues to try and gun it. With his windows down, I can hear him cursing, and I take this moment to scoop up the dog and run out of there. He then opens the car door, about to get out. I can't remember any descriptions about this man, other than he was quite overweight. Again, because of the shock, I can't even recall his race or age, or anything like that. At that moment, a truck pulls up beside us, with two youngish men inside. It was like a construction truck or something. They roll down the window, and ask if this guy is bothering me. They say it loudly, and it spooks the guy as he gets back into his car. He's then able to peel out in reverse from whatever hole the car was stuck in. He very quickly smashes from the field, back onto the street, and takes off. The kind men who stopped apparently saw all of this happen, and they were just as confused as I was. What was this guy's game plan? What was he attempting? To kidnap me in broad daylight? With people around? I'm not sure. I'm so glad that his car got stuck, and I didn't have to find out. It was all just very strange. I can be overconfident at times about my safety, but after this, I've learned to always be alert. Bad things can happen anytime and anywhere, so don't freeze in between fight or flight. So many times I've frozen instead of fighting or flighting, when I really should have taken some kind of action. Not sure if in this situation, my guardian angels were winged spirits, or if they were two young men in a construction truck. Either way, I'm thankful for them.